to turn these on. Good morning. Welcome to the Building Blocks to Economic Self-Sufficiency breakout session. I'm glad to see so many people here at 8.30 in the morning on the last day of the REC conference. Um, my name is Gretchen Lehman. I'm the Program Manager for the Assets for Independence Program at the Administration for Children and Families in the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we are on live stream this morning. If you're watching via live stream, you can send an email to WREC at ESI-DC.com for the PowerPoint presentations for this. And anyone can go online and look at the bios for all of us on the panels at the REC conference site, which is WRConference.net. Um, so I was asked to moderate this session and to give a little bit of information about why um, why we're interested in integrating financial capabilities into programs like the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families programs and other social service programs. At the Assets for Independence program and at the Administration for Children and Families more broadly, we're really interested in thinking about ways to improve program outcomes and to improve the financial stability and the economic well-being of low-income people in general. And we really believe that strategies to build assets and to improve the financial capabilities of these people are one of the key ways to do that. Um, whether it's in pairing that with services that they may receive at a community health center, through a TANF program, through a Head Start program, or in any of the many ways that these populations are served. Um, so we, several years ago, the Assets for Independence program and the Administrations for Children and Families started what is called the Asset Initiative, which was exploring ways to take the knowledge that has been developed around asset building and financial education um, through the Assets for Independence program, which I guess I should say, the Assets for Independence program is a federal discretionary grant program that um, funds community-based organizations and states and local governments to um, provide matched savings accounts called individual development accounts. But it's a relatively small program. There's a lot of um, limits on its use. But there's been a lot of de um, knowledge developed over the past 15 years of that program about how to work with low-income people and to build their assets and to improve their financial capabilities. So in about 2009 or so, um, the program started looking at ways to take that knowledge and leverage it and think about how that can be um, built into other programs at ACF and to think about the populations that we're serving through the multitude of programs at the Administration for Children and Families. Um, the Asset Initiative has had several iterations. We've had several different, um, well, we've been doing a lot of work through contracts and looking at work out in the regions, work through different programs, different special populations. And now uh, the current iteration is called the Asset Initiative Partnership. And we're actually working with the Corporation for Enterprise Development um, on that Asset Initiative Partnership. And we're looking at several pilots, some of which you'll be hearing about today and um, developing resources and different tools and thinking about learning communities and ways to really leverage the work that has been done, the work that's being done out in the field and thinking about what we can be doing next. So um, today on this panel, you'll be hearing about integration at various stages. Um, we'll be hearing about research that is going to be leading to a pilot that is launching very soon. We'll be hearing about a pilot that has sort of in its last stage, in its last pilot stages and thinking about the next stages. And we'll be hearing research from a completed pilot. Um, our, we have um, three fantastic panelists. Um, you'll be hearing first from Mariana Chilton. She's the associate professor at Drexel University School of Public Health where she's the director of the Center for Hunger-Free Communities and one of the principal investigators for the Children's Health Watch. And then you'll be hearing from Kate Griffin, the director of financial capability at the Corporation for Enterprise Development, CFED, where she oversees projects that promote matched savings accounts and other asset building strategies for adults and children. Before joining CFED, she worked at the Grameen Foundation, where I'm sure many of you have heard of the work that they've done internationally to um, bring financial services to low-income people. And then finally, we'll be hearing from Casey Weidrick, the, the Senior Program Manager at the Corporation for Enterprise Development on their Applied Research Team. 
She ma manages various research projects there, including their Assets and Opportunities Scorecard. You can follow Mariana Chilton at, on Twitter, at Mariana Chilton, and you can follow Casey and Kate at CFED. So with no further ado, we'll start with Mariana. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here so early. Um, we were remarking before that uh, you have four blonde ladies that look a lot alike up here, but I am unique because I'm not wearing glasses today. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to my Pennsylvania colleagues. I don't know if you're here, but I haven't seen you from the Department of Public Welfare and beyond. Hello, Pennsylvania. Thanks for sticking with it um, with our new demonstration that I hope to get into today. Today, I'm going to talk about financial management strategies among TANF recipients. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you about uh, two research studies that, have been, that are both multi-site um, and ongoing. Children's Health Watch, which has been going on for almost uh, for 13 years, uh, right after welfare reform, we got up and running. Uh, it took us a few years to get up and running. And then another study called Witnesses to Hunger, which is a participatory action study, another multi-site study that's been ongoing for five years. I'll talk to, talk to you only about our uh, findings on financial management and economic security. And I'll talk to you about how that, that research um, is leading to a demonstration study that we're getting ready to start on Monday. So first, I want to introduce you to Children's Health Watch. It's a multi-site study that has a sample size of over 65,000 families in five cities, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Little Rock, and Minneapolis. And what we do is we look at the impact of public policies and programs. For instance, we look at SNAP. TANF, WIC, Medicaid, housing subsidies, childcare subsidies, et cetera, and we see how those impact the bodies and brains of little kids and their caregivers. So the outcomes that we're tracking are food insecurity, hospitalization rates, child well-being, child development, and child growth. And we're also looking at maternal depressive symptoms. I'm not going to show you too many of the results there. I'm not going to throw up a lot of graphs because I'm going to try to get into the economic security. But what we focus on with Children's Health Watch is primarily economic insecurity. So we track food insecurity, which doesn't happen in a vacuum, as you all know. It is also related to housing insecurity. That means families are um, maybe going from house to house, uh, couch surfing, may not have a stable place to live, behind on rent, evicted, et cetera. We also look at energy, energy insecurity when families can't pay their utility bills, are living without electricity or running water, maybe using their stoves to heat their home. And what we can do is we can see how that lands a child, a young child, into the hospital. Now, I'm going to introduce you to Witnesses to Hunger. It's a slightly different, but we recruited off of our original sample in Philadelphia with Children's Health Watch. This, too, now has become a multi-site study. We're in Philadelphia, Camden, New Jersey, Boston, and Baltimore. And we're starting a new site in Washington, D.C. this summer. Um, what we do is we do participatory action research. We utilize the methodology of photo voice. It's an ongoing ethnographic study as well. We utilize individual interviews. We do focus groups. Um, and some social action kinds of things. We've been working primarily with 67 mothers and two fathers of young children under the age of six. The women, women and men primarily take photos um, with their own digital cameras that we've given them to be able to express their own concerns about um, trying to break the cycle of poverty for their children and what it means for them in terms of their health and well-being in relation to participating in public assistance programs. These are some of the moms that we work with. Um, and I'll just give you an example of some of their photographs. This is one of them by Crystal Sears. She said, I wanted people to see that things are not all that bad. Thanks to food stamps, my daughter was able to eat breakfast this morning. There she's talking about the importance of food stamps for health and well-being of her kids. But if you look at the photograph a second time, really that child is hanging off the edge, right at the edge of a cliff. And that's what the women talk about all the time, is that the public assistance programs keep the families from falling off the edge, but sometimes the system can actually push them over the edge. I'm going to talk to you about how that happens. Um, are, there any wealth, are there any TANF recipients in the room that would like to identify yourselves? Okay, if not, they're here with us in spirit. This is Chrissy Koch, Barbie Izquierdo, and Joanna Cruz. Witnesses to Hunger, because of participatory action, we're working alongside of moms who have been on TANF or who've been on and off of TANF, have been churning through the, through the systems of Philadelphia. These are from the, this is the Philadelphia data. Um, but I want you to pay attention primarily to the um, lady in the center, Joanna Cruz. 
Um, my friends thought I was really crazy when we were going to start Witnesses to Hunger, and I started giving out cameras to, um, to the moms and dads that we were um, interviewing in the emergency room at St. Christopher's through Children's Health Watch. They thought, you know, it's not, what kind of photographs are you going to get? And I wasn't really sure either. But I want to show you the first photograph from the first participant. Actually, this was given to me by Barbie, who's Joanna's neighbor. This is Joanna's kitchen. And Barbie gave me the photograph. She said, I gave my camera to my, friend, my neighbor, Joanna, because I wanted people to see what it's like for her. She's living without running water, without electricity. I want people to see how hard it is to be a single mom, that things can get so bad you're afraid to ask for help. Joanna was living here, again, without running water, um, without electricity at the time. And uh, she would go across the street to use Barbie's um, bathroom with her children. She was living there with her six-year-old and her two-year-old at the time. Interestingly, in the Children's Health Watch survey, which we also utilize with Witnesses to Hunger, she comes out as housing secure, because this is the house that she grew up in. But she comes out as extremely food insecure and clearly energy insecure. Um, there's tons of research to back this up, but this is from the women's perspective a photograph of economic insecurity. The women also talk a lot about being depressed, um, having a lot of um, anxiety, having a lot of symptoms that are related to trauma and being socially isolated. I'm not gonna talk about that a lot today, but it, it, it has been informing our demonstration. And when we bring the women together in focus groups and we do training so that we can go to Washington DC um, and talk about the experiences of hunger and poverty and what the public assistance programs can and cannot do, um, the women love to be together in a group, and they feel very powerful and actually more powerful as a group than they are as individuals. That too has been informing our demonstration, but I won't talk too much about that. Some of the things that the women have talked to us about is that we want to be economically secure. We want to stop being hungry. We want to stop not being able to pay our rent, and we want to be able to pay our energy bills on time and live a healthy and happy life. So we want to focus on that. So we've been focusing primarily on resilience what are the kinds of things that help families to be economically secure? So the women will talk a lot about income, different ways that they make their, um, they pull in money, but they also talk about the dynamics of, of getting an income and being able to participate in the public assistance programs, which are, are extremely important to their health and well-being and to their sense of a future um, and of belonging. They also talk a little bit about assets. It's been a very creative process how they manage their assets. They do have them, but they may not look quite like we think of having a savings account. So our research has started to focus on, on these, three, these things and the uh, dynamics. So um, the uh, families that we work with primarily talk about having very low wage jobs that are often, um, that have scattered hours, unpredictable hours, their hours are always changing, um, or also they're seasonal. And there's a great publication um, by Alicia Coleman Jensen called, talking, talking about how the, re the relationship between non-standard work hours is actually a prescription for food insecurity. She calls it working for peanuts. That's based on empirical evidence from the CPS survey from the Economic Research Service at the U USDA. Let me show you how Joanna Cruz, the woman of the kitchen, talks about it. That's Joanna Cruz. She's wearing a little pink sticker that says, I'm an ER visitor. She had just come back from the emergency room, and you see the other stickers on her on her wall. She said, my kids are sick all the time. I'm constantly, if I'm not at work, I'm living in the emergency room because my kids have colds, um, ear infections, rashes, etc. It's because of the way I'm living. She talks about, uh, she took photographs of her community service job. She's on TANF at the time. She said, I have to show up for community service and do all this filing. It's very, very depressing. And then I want to take a picture of my tokens to get to work because today is Tuesday. Tomorrow is Wednesday, I only have two tokens left. How am I gonna to get to work on Thursday and Friday? I don't have enough tokens. I don't know how to get there. And if I don't get there, I'm gonna get sanctioned. I'm gonna lose TANF benefits. This is another photograph by Ashley Ortiz who said this is my metaphor for the system, for the man, for welfare. I don't have a phone, I don't have a house phone, I don't have a cell phone, I don't have a house phone, but I need to, need to get recertified for my food stamps. And I'm supposed to call in, but this is the closest pay phone. And if I do call from a payphone, how is the welfare caseworker supposed to call me back? So they know that the help is there, but getting access to that help is very problematic, and from their perspective, is broken. That's why I asked, are there TANF recipients in the room? It's so important to be working, with TANF, working alongside of recipients 
to see how well our programs are working and to hear it from their perspectives. And what greater way to do it than uh, photographs. This is from Shireen McGee. She said, I took this picture because I wanted you to see, all, look at all these moms and babies. We were all just in a training program to become um, medical billing specialists. And so we just graduated, but I didn't get any help trying to find a job in medical billing uh, from the TANF office, or from the EARN Center, which we call the Education and Training Programs in Philadelphia. And she said, I'm calling this graduation to the same poor wages because I really wanted to get my earned income tax credit, so I went to look for a job at McDonald's. So you've all graduated, we've all been certified, but we still can't find jobs, and then we're pushed out into other low-wage jobs that are unrelated to the education and training that we've been learning. From her perspective, welfare is like a chain. All right, I'm toggling back and forth between these two studies, Children's Health Watch and Witnesses to Hunger. In Children's Health Watch, we looked at, because we started learning from the women of Witnesses to Hunger, how they would lose their benefits once they got a little raise or got a better job, we looked at, does this have a relationship in um, child hunger? So this is child hunger rates. If you look at the yellow bar, those are families that are currently receiving SNAP benefits and TANF benefits. And when we did, what we did is we compared families that had recently lost their benefits due to an increase in income. That's the pink bar. It's a, there's an increase in child hunger, which is the severest form of food insecurity in the country, when families lose their benefits. It does show you that the benefits actually buffer families. But those families are earning more money. The cliff effect, as you all know. So that's how the women talk about it. Let me get into the financial, um, the financial experiences of the women. We've been, we're still investigating this and I can't spend a lot of time on it, but I wanted to talk about their financial experiences. I'll give you one example and I'll talk about the way that they earn income. And I'm not gonna talk much about banking either, just let you know that they don't have bank accounts. And we look at, we're looking in the Children's Health, in the uh, Witnesses to Hunger study, um, we do at coding in Atlas TI qualitative, it's a qualitative research method where we're looking at codes and how they're interrelating with each other. So the financial experiences of the women, are co they're constantly in debt to their friends, to banks, to companies. They have income shocks, they're behind on rent, they get cut off of benefits. That is another, it creates an income shock for them. And then we look at the results. What, what's happening when those kinds of financial, those, those dynamics are happening? Housing insecurity, I have to move from one house to the other, I have to live in my car. Having to make trade-offs, paying the rent one month, paying the utilities the next month, being beholden to the landlord. Can't get, can't get to places, I have bad credit. Also, they will steal or they'll fight over money or fight over resources um, and become very dependent on others in very risky ways. Um, they often talk about wanting to be stable and think about a savings account and a checking account as being um, economically stable. But then we've been focusing, what are your aspirations? What is the future for you? The women would talk about, I want to own my own business. I want to be a caterer. I want to have a restaurant. I want to go to school so I can get a better job. I want to save some money so I can buy a house or so I can pay my rent on time. Um, I want to have a career and I don't want to be dependent on my mother, my auntie, or my boyfriend. So let me give you an example. When a kid gets sick, what it does is it upsets a precarious balance. Kids who are poor are more likely to be sick. If you have a low-wage job, the kids are sick, you lose hours at work. Then you lose your wages. Then you're behind on rent. Then you have to borrow money from family or friends if you happen to have them. Or you have to steal money. You're beholden to the people that you've borrowed money from. That's your friends, family, your boyfriend, a sugar daddy who may not be a boyfriend but you're financially dependent on him, or your landlord and that puts you further into debt, causing major physical, social, and emotional pain, and it just goes on from there. So what are the strategies? The strategies are, yes, we need public assistance to be able to have some income and to buffer our families, um, but we also want jobs. We want to have a good career, so there's a lot of discussion about wages and dis job dissatisfaction and not being satisfied with how much income they can make and being, dealing with the monster under the bed, of knowing they need to get an education to get a better wage, but being needing to work so they can feed their families. It's a terrible tussle. So there's the official way of getting income, and then there's the shadow way of getting an income. You all know about it. We don't talk enough about it. The families are working under the table. We would call this legal, right? If they're working for a catering company and they're serving and they get paid in cash and they don't tell their caseworker. Um, the illegal ways are having their own businesses, but they don't call it a business, they call it a side hustle. Well, I do hair and nails on the weekend, you know, prom 
this is a big time, proms, graduations, et cetera. So the women will be able to make a little bit of extra cash on the weekends, maybe $20, $50, et cetera. Where do they put that money? In the bra, not in the bank. Okay, we can talk more about that during dialogue. And I'd have to say that um, they misreport their income to the caseworkers because they don't want their caseworkers to know that they've made, had a little fluctuation because they know that when they're fluctuate, fluctuating, they may get cut off of benefits and they'll be worse off than they were before. This is very problematic. What are their businesses? Hair, nails, catering, and baking, housekeeping, childcare, providing rides to others and other services, um, doing uh, reselling, flipping things, going to the Goodwill, getting free clothes, and then selling them off of the front stoop for a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. Um, and also pretty, getting pretty good at weatherization and carpentry because they can pick up some free classes at Home Depot and then bring it back to the neighborhoods and try to help their neighbors and get paid for it. I'm going to skip through the um, financial services um, and just let you all know that so many of the families on TANF and on SNAP are unbanked um, and just show you the financial world that is around so many of the families that we work with. Here you can see, just in the photograph, two for-profit tax services next to two pawn shops, things for lottery, and then because we're interested in nutrition, uh, there's the produce connection sandwiched between a tobacco shop or a smoke shop and the Happy Donut. Expecting families to manage their finances in a way that we can as uh, middle class or upper middle class professionals is absolutely inaccurate and, and they're not capable because their environments are not conducive to good financial management in the way that we would think about conventional banking. So what are the implications for policymakers and administrators? We have to get rid of this cliff effect. And this can be done at the state level. We have got to look at our families worse off when they get their jobs that we're trying to get, help them get because they've lost their benefits. We've got to look at our calculations and start removing this, start, start removing those barriers. We've got to get rid of the asset limits. Pennsylvania still has a $1,000 asset limit that has not been changed since 1996. To save enough money for a safe and affordable home for first and last month's deposit is $1,200. There's no way that a family can save enough money to get a safe and affordable home if they're participating in TANF and following all of the rules. We need to incentivize bank accounts. TANF and SNAP are often a disincentive for having a bank account. We need to find creative opportunities for, for match savings accounts, and we need to support and incentivize the resilience and the wisdom that is already there that is currently criminalized by our system. If we found out that families were making money on the weekends and not reporting it, that would be considered um, in grounds for cu either cutting benefits or sanctioning someone. We've got to change that. That's, we've got to think about the resilience and the positive opportunities that families actually already have in their neighborhoods and their wisdom and build on it and incentivize it. So I just want to introduce, um, introduce you to the uh, network, we're calling it the Building Wealth and Health Network that we're launching in Philadelphia. And that's thanks to a partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare that has been working with us for the past year and a half for the planning launching on Monday. We're focusing on three aspects. We're uh, providing match savings accounts, financial education, um, and also peer support. And that gets at the issues of social isolation and maternal depressive symptoms and exposure to violence and trauma. All three of those things, we are hoping, will buffer the health and well-being of little kids and their caregivers on TANF. Uh, I'll just tell you about the design and then I'll end there. We have two intervention groups. One intervention group will get match savings accounts. That's $5 a week, which we will then match one-to-one. -one. We're working with a, federal, with a credit union called American Heritage. All of the families that we work with will become shareholders in the credit union. So they'll have match savings accounts and they'll show up to weekly financial education classes and this is over the course of 18 months and it counts toward their work requirement. Um, we, the second intervention group will get the same as the first but then we're adding on the trauma-informed peer support groups where the women will work, to, women and men will be working together to establish common goals with each other and to work on their issues of uh, depressive symptoms and trauma, exposure to violence, and start to create some work readiness. We have opportunities for work readiness. And actually, it's based off of uh, the Grameen model. We can talk more about it during the dialogue. I'm going to skip through all of this. 
um, and you can download the, uh, the slides from the websites that these are the things that we're working on in the financial education, the empowerment groups. It's going to be a lot of fun and very challenging at the same time. And we're measuring outcomes on four different levels, income, education, and program participation, financial well-being, we're looking at credit scores, also in savings increases, economic security, food insecurity, housing insecurity, energy insecurity, and also we're looking at maternal depressive symptoms and child health and development. So I look forward to our dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mariana, that was, I think, a really powerful way to kick us off, so thank you for that. Thank you. So, um, as Gretchen alluded to, I've, I've spent my career working around financial inclusion um, and asset building, and so it's only been in the last year or so that I've started to understand how the TANF system works. And I have to say that one thing that has struck me is that um, TANF is, is often very grounded in this language of self-sufficiency. Um, it's, a, it's a goal that TANF programs are working towards for the TANF recipients. Um, and there are a number of different ways that I've seen programs dissect this. But what we found at CFED is that often getting a job and increasing income um, is insufficient to that idea of getting ahead, of becoming fully self-sufficient. And I think Mariana did a really great job of kind of teasing out why that's so um, with her in with her imagery, it's, it's when a family is able to really start to chip away at building some sort of asset base um, and truly accumulate wealth that they can start to withstand all of these crises that seem to hit the household and could cause them to further fall back and go back onto the TANF benefit. Techniques that help families to exercise better financial management um, or begin to save towards the future, things that um, we call asset building strategies, um, are one important building block to really helping families achieve um, that self-sufficiency goal that, that is so important. And it seems on paper like because of that marriage of the goals, that asset building and the, the, that uh, relationship with the TANF benefit, that seems like a good marriage. Um, in practice, however, um, what services can feasibly be delivered via a TANF relationship and how that can be done. Um, there's a lot of, of um, questions still there. Um, and this panel's you know, serving to show you kind of three different ways where that can be done. So there's still a lot of work ahead, I think, in terms of both building up um, uh, a sense of what practice, practically is, is um, working as well as what the research evidence shows us. I do have some data today to share with you um, from a project that we collaborated on um, together with the Utah Department of Work Sur Workforce Services um, and the Fair Credit Foundation, which is a local nonprofit in Utah that provides um, a range of asset building services. Um, but I also, you know, in addition to the data, really want to um, frame this in the context of the very thoughtful approach that the Utah Department of Workforce Services has taken um, to really um, evaluate and refine the program based on a client feedback loop and really looking at early lessons learned. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. Um, this is a very simple theory of change that, that um, my colleagues have come up with that really looks at why this matters. Um, in, a, in a system that really cares deeply about helping people to find jobs and, and retain those jobs, um, there are a number of <clears throat> kind of financial issues that really affects clients' um, abilities to find and retain those jobs. Things like how a poor credit score affects somebody's ability to actually get that job um, or to get a loan, to buy a car, to be able to tra uh, get transportation to the job. Um, access to transportation and childcare subsidies can often be very important. Um, and then things like um, not having access to a bank account and using a costly check casher starts to chip away at that income that they are earning um, as some of it goes to costly fees. If we're able to move the dial a little bit on those issues by helping people to improve credit scores, um, access ancillary work support services, uh, reduce expenditures on costly financial services, and start to have that financial cushion to help them absorb minor crises, then we hopefully, linking back uh, in this theory of change, um, can have an impact on that all-important goal of finding and keeping that job. And it's really a recognition of this need that the Utah Department of Workforce Services um, and the Fair Credit Foundation started to collaborate on this financial education integration project. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, 
Uh, budgeting is a requirement for um, people who are accessing something called the Work Success Program, which is a work readiness program offered by the Department of Workforce Services in Utah. Um, and uh, really, um, the staff there started a conversation with the Fair Credit Foundation in recognition that um, issues around budgeting and credit management were really affecting the people attending this work success program. And so they came up with a program, fairly simple on paper, that says, what happens when we dedicate an entire day to budgeting and credit management? Uh, in the morning, uh, people come in and um, get some support in accessing their credit report. Um, they have six hours of really dynamic, engaging training. Um, and afterwards, um, they're able to spend some time um, working through budget worksheets, continuing to look at, at credit reports, and, and beginning to take some action there. Um, and so uh, this sort of project was born based on, on this idea. Uh, CFED, together with ICF International, uh, got involved through the Asset Initiative Partnership, um, really to um, help refine the program model um, and provide some additional support in gathering data um, uh, to make some programmatic decisions, um, looking at whether clients found the training relevant um, and did they utilize the information at the end of the day. And ultimately, uh, this was a pilot that was, has been undertaken um, starting in July of last year, so it's been running for almost 12 months now. Um, ultimately, the, the goal was to look and see whether this is something that they would want to expand statewide. Um, here we've got sort of the list of organizations that have been working on this, and um, I don't know if, if Sisifo Taititi from the Utah Department of Workforce Services is around here. Back, back. Oh, great. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Sifo's been a wonderful partner, and she can talk with you more about sort of where she's going to take this next. Um, Fair Credit Foundation. Um, Utah Department of Workforce Services also has a great relationship with the University of Utah's Social Research Institute, and they've been lovely partners on this as well, as well as the folks um, um, supported by uh, the Administration for Children and Families on the Asset Initiative Partnership. I won't dwell on this, but there is a, a pretty robust logic model. Uh, don't worry about trying to read the fine print here. Um, but even for something that is a six-hour training, um, really kind of focusing on um, being clear about what we're trying to achieve was a really important step forward in, in, in refining this program model. And so taking the time to do this, I think, was a really important step um, for all of the program partners that was, was in, were involved. Um, just to blow this up for you a little bit, um, in terms of just immediate and short-term outcomes, some of the things that we were looking to understand from the participants was whether there was an increase in, in credit awareness, um, an increase in knowledge for how to access credit reports, um, increase in, in a, um, knowing how to create a household budget, um, increased knowledge of strategies for managing debt and then using those strategies, increased awareness of other types of financial management resources such as VITA, credit counseling, uh, individual development accounts getting banked, um, and then actually um, using those financial management resources through Fair Credit Foundation or, or other resources locally. So these are the sorts of things that we were looking at. Um, that was done through, the way that we looked at it was uh, through a, um, first a pre and post test that was done on the day of training, um, and that was all, all sort of self-reported information. Um, we did a three-month follow-up afterwards that was really looking at, uh, we called it a customer satisfaction phone survey that looked at um, um, how people felt about the training uh, in retrospect and uh, whether they were utilizing any of the information that picked up that training. We also have some additional information that we, looked, uh, that we are looking at. We don't have the, the data uh, yet around it um, that helps us look around differences around demographics, employment and wage data. Uh, and then, of course, there were a lot of informal conversations happening throughout the, the, the course of time there. The folks who participated, um, first of all, within the Work Success Program, you're either refer referred there through your TANF program, um, but it's also a, a general program that is part of the Department of Workforce Services, so you have a, a general population as well that's receiving services that can be referred into this Work Success Program. Um, so you can see here a little bit of a sense of, of the financial situation of the, of the people taking part in this. Um, Many don't have checking or savings accounts, and that's even more so for the TANF population. Um, many are not currently saving money, again, more so for the TANF population. Um, but again, also sort of issues around um, knowledge around accessing credit reports, um, how credit problems are ex uh, affecting their ability to buy cars or rent a place to live, um, being behind on utilities, um, so sort of things that, that we're seeing in terms of their current financial situation. 
So let me just walk through very quickly uh, what we found um, uh, so far in the first, this is based on the first, I believe, 10 months of the program. Um, uh, just sort of what we've learned in terms of, of against these outcomes. I'll buzz, buzz through these pretty quickly, but um, we did see, in fact, um, an increase in credit awareness um, and um, people uh, were quite positively responding to now understanding how to obtain their credit report and read it. Um, and that is something that um, continued when we looked at the three-month um, follow-up. Uh, certainly, people knew how to access their credit reports. That was something that increased over time, so the increased knowledge of, of, of where to go and how to actually look at the, at the information, um, and then how to understand and navigate what they were seeing on the, on, the, on the paper. So we saw not only an increase around understanding the credit reports, but we also saw in the three-month follow-up that a number of participants had actively worked to clean up their credit following the class. Um, certainly, knowledge of how to create uh, a household budget is something that uh, we saw was impacted through participating in the class, um, as well as increased knowledge of, knowledge of strategies um, for managing debt. In fact, in a lot of the informal feedback and sort of open-ended um, questions, that was often where people had a lot of, of things to say, where, where sort of these nuggets of information that they had picked up in terms of, of um, snowballing uh, credit payments, uh, debt payments, and things like that, um, people were really appreciative, appreciative of the tips and tricks that they were, they were picking up in terms of managing debt. And then uh, um, sort of how and when did that translate into strategies for of actually using those strategies. Um, and this is where we start to see sort of this difference between intentions and act actions, right? Um, there were lots of good intentions coming out of this training, um, and only I would say maybe a moderate uptake in terms of the ac actually implementing um, uh, the uh, activities that people had good intentions about doing following the training. So um, here, immediately after the training, a number of people said that they plan to use a budget um, or seek help in managing debt, um, but a much lower number were actually doing this when, they, um, uh, when we checked in again with them three months later. Similarly, um, there was definitely an increased awareness of the financial management resources um, and <clears throat> people saying that, that they now had a better understanding of where they could go for help um, but we didn't see quite as many people as, as would have been um, expected given how they had responded to what they planned to do following the training in terms of what they then um, went and, and uh, accessed following the training. Again, some people did go out and, and do take some actions, but um, not as robust as what had been initially uh, indicated uh, at the end of the, of the initial training. And I would say perhaps not surprising. I think we can all point to other research that tells us that the difference between intention and action and that traveling that road can be quite difficult. Um, but again, um, it's really, I think, remarkable to note what the intentions people had after, after this sort of day of training and, and thinking through um, what they could be doing around cleaning up credit scores, using budgets, managing their debts, and things like that. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's really um, important to look at those intentions. And what that means then in terms of where, do we, where does Utah go from here uh, next um, after this initial pilot, um, we certainly see, have seen that, uh, that there are a lot of people who need, this, who need this sort of information and to take actions differently in terms of the number of participants who aren't banked or have credit problems. Um, they really liked the training and I didn't go through the, the um, uh, training feedback but they really love this training. Um, and they have a lot of good intentions um, with only some um, behavior change. Um, but we did see uh, that there is a retention in that knowledge, and so that's a really good, um, a good thing. Um, but what that means, I think, more importantly, in terms of thinking through um, this program model uh, and thinking through um, whether it's worthwhile for the Depart Department of Workforce Services to be offering this as part of, of what they do in a work readiness program, um, that's where we're really excited. And um, um, as of today, the Department of Workforce Services is looking to expand this statewide, um, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, so we think that you know, in the context of, of implementing this within TANF, you can increase knowledge and create good intentions. Um, Taking the steps towards behavior change is more difficult, and so as as um, 
as Utah looks to uh, expand this statewide, what they're going to do to make changes to that program design model so that you can get more uh, in terms of behavior change is something they'll be looking about uh, at. Uh, but this does make sense to do in the context of a TNF and work readiness context. Um, I just, I think I want to laud uh, the support that the Department of Works or Services along with their researchers and, and Fair Credit Foundation all gave a lot of, of, of time and attention to really collecting this customer feedback um, and acting on it uh, in terms of the program design changes. That was really important, I think, in terms of, of what we're seeing here. Um, so I'll leave it there and happy to discuss more during the um, uh, Q&A. Good morning. I'm Casey Wiedrich, also with CFED, and um, thanks for everyone being here this morning and being in this uh, great big ballroom uh, to join us to talk about all of this important work that's happening today. So sort of the research that I'm going to present is sort of the next stage. So this is a completed research project that is looking at the same um, types of programs that Mariana and Kate were talking about, but we've um, completed the project and looking at what's the impact of when you incorporate all these elements into a program of people leaving TANF in a work-ready context, you know, what's the impact in the long term on families? Um, so the name of the pilot that CFED is presenting on here today is the Assessing Financial Capabilities Outcome, or AFCO pilot, and we, um, it was made possible with funding from the Treasury Department, and we conducted this research in partnership with the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also with the Office of Financial Empowerment at New York City's Department of Consumer Affairs, and they were, um, everyone involved in this was really a great partnership, and we're really excited that the findings are now released and we can share with you the results of all the, the hard work that we did over the past couple of years. So I feel like my colleagues have done a really good job setting up sort of what the financial issues are in the lives of people who are currently on TANF or transitioning off of TANF, um, and the importance of why it's a good idea to integrate financial services into these type of programs. So again, what we were looking at is, okay, then what's the long-term impact of incorporating those things into our program? So again, what's the impact of um, doing financial counseling with folks coupled with financial access, so offering people the opportunity to open a safe and affordable checking account. And we implemented this in the context of a workforce development program working with people transitioning off of TANF that's operated by the City of New York's um, Parks and Recreation Department. And the name of that program is the Parks Opportunity Program. And it's a transitional employment program run in New York City, one of the largest in the country. It's a six-month program, offers people full-time employment along with um, job development, human capital enrichment activities on a weekly basis. Um, people work full-time, earn over $9 an hour. They are referred from the TANF agency in New York City to the Parks Department, um, who screens them for work readiness and eligibility for the program. Um, and in the implementing of our pilot, we actually hired three former POP participants as enrollment specialists, and that's how I'll refer to them in the, the presentation going forward, um, to help us enroll participants in our research study, but also to help us manage it on the ground. And we think that um, including these former participants was actually a really key factor in the success of the implementation of the program that I'll talk about more in just a minute. The bank accounts that we offered to the folks in the program were offered through Popular Community Bank, um, which is one of the banks in New York City that's participating in the city's direct deposit initiative. And what that basically means is that the city of New York has been working with a number of banks to sort of pre-screen the products that they're offering that they feel like are safe and appropriate for the populations that they care about in New York City. Um, you know, and I think, in thinking about incorporating this into your work, thinking about the quality of the products that you're offering to folks is a really important step. I think one other step is to think about sort of, um, even if folks in your program don't have a bank account, they have ideas about what banks they like in their communities and sort of those ideas about who they want to bank with um, do make a difference. So I think it's important to consider sort of their attitudes towards financial institutions and products when you're choosing your partners. 
Um, so the account that we chose, free account, no minimum balance, no monthly fees, ATM cards, a network of free ATMs. Um, and we tried to make it very easy for folks to open these accounts. Bank representatives came to the sites so that folks could open the, um, the accounts right there with them. We were very much encouraging people signing up for direct deposit of their paycheck. Um, and so we, people, when they opened their account there, got account number right there so they could sign up for direct deposit at the same time. And I'll talk more about sort of how we integrated that in in a second. And then the, the financial counseling that we incorporated into it were offered through the, the financial empowerment centers, which are um, a service that OFE provides through nonprofit partners in the city of New York throughout the city. And it's free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling with a trained provider. Um, again, people work one-on-one -on -one with folks. When you come in, you sort of, they do an assessment, pull your credit report, sort of get a look at where you are, what issues the family would want to talk about with the counselor, and they'll work with people on short-term or they even, the services are available over long-term. People can come back again. It's always free to meet with these folks. Um, you know, through this pilot, we offered this to the participants and really helped facilitate setting up sort of the first appointment with the counselor. But folks were really encouraged to follow up, although in some of our data we found that most people who do, did attend only attended one um, financial counseling session. So this slide just walks you through a little bit of how we integrated the AFCO pilot into sort of the, the normal operations of POP. And I think when we were incorporating that in the sort of the new elements into the POP program, we did really think about how to do this in a way that really didn't disrupt the normal operations. So that it was very easy for program staff to add these additional things without sort of uprooting everything that they've been doing with these pilots. So, you know, sort of the top line there kind of shows you the flow of how people get started in the POP program. They get, they um, are referred to parks from HRA, which is the TANF agency in New York City. Um, and once they are determined to be eligible for POP, the first step is a new hire orientation. Um, and as a part of that day-long orientation, we incorporated the offer of the bank accounts um, into that schedule. So it was sort of like an hour out of the day. They met with the POP specialists, who again were the former participants in the programs, and the and the, and the banker who was there to answer any questions. And again, sort of what we decided to do was not have the banker actually even make the offer. We had the former participants be the one sort of messaging the account. And they worked with OFE to come up with the script, sort of speaking from their own personal experience about what are the benefits of having a bank account? Why did it make a difference in their lives to have direct deposit? And we felt like that was really important to, again, sort of we sort of have the things that we think about, like, oh, here's why you should have a bank account. But again, sort of getting the personal experiences of these folks to say, oh, this is what we think is going to make a difference. This is what we think folks are worried about. Um, you know, we felt like that was a really effective way to sort of talk to people about these services that we were offering. So then people sort of go out into work in the, with the Parks Department. The next time we touched them with the AFCO pilot was two weeks later. At their first professional day, they got another opportunity to open accounts on site. The bankers were there. That's when we enrolled people in the research. And that was also the point where we offered the financial um, counseling treatment. And that was, again, something where it was randomized so that we could look at the difference of what's the difference if we, if we give this financial counseling to some, to some folks compared to folks that didn't have the offer of it. And the way that we randomly assigned that was by the borough and the month in which they enrolled in the program. When we enrolled for six months um, between January and May of 2012. And so, and during that time, we enrolled about a thousand people in the study, um, split fairly evenly between the treatment group, those who were offered financial counseling, and the control group, those who weren't. Then we also tracked people who actually attended the counseling. So you can see there that it was about 40% of people that we offered counseling to actually attended the counseling, which talking with OFE and the financial counselors, they felt was actually a pretty typical take up rate for other types of programs. So, and the data that we collected on these folks, we collected survey data from them, both at baseline when they enrolled in the study, then at six months, and we followed up with them at 12 months. Um, also, we got consent to pull credit reports at, at baseline, and then six months and 12 months, and these were soft pulls of their credit report, so they don't actually impact credit scores. 
Um, and then for people that opened bank accounts with Popular Community Bank, we actually got monthly transaction data, so we could actually look at how people were using the bank accounts. So again, I think Mariana gave you a really good sense of what the financial lives of folks who are in these types of public benefit programs really looks like. So just to give you a sense of who was in our population, primarily single women with kids, 20% reported being homeless at baseline. Um, then we have some of the data from the baseline survey about their financial situation, you know, really high use of alternative financial services, um, fairly high average debt, credit scores, so 558, that's quite a low credit score. Um, I think the other important fact in here is that only half of the folks that we were able to pull credit reports for even had a credit score. So half of the people, their credit files were too thin to even have a credit score, which also shuts them out from the opportunities to buy a car, that kind of stuff. Sometimes even getting a cell phone, right? If you don't have credit, you can't, you can't get a cell phone. Um, so that it's not also just credit repair. Sometimes it is just credit building, how to, how to help these people establish credit. Um, Another thing looking at was, again, the, the level of bank accounts that people had at baseline. So only a third of people had a bank account at baseline. Another third had never had a bank account, and then the other third had was previously banked. We asked people, you know, about why they didn't, and you can see I have some quotes up here. Um, you can see that it's sort of a mix of experience of people who have had a bank account, had some problems with it, other people who just have never been in the system aren't, haven't really had a lot of interest in it. We did have someone that say, I can't with public assistance. We did ask another question about um, whether or not fear of losing public benefits is a factor in whether or not people save. And there was a portion, about 40%, who did, who reported that they do think about that um, and whether they save. So people are aware of the asset limits um, and, don't, and feel like it's a barrier to being able to save. Okay, so I'll move pretty quickly into the actual data here too. So to give you a sense of, so we talked about people didn't have a bank account and this is some of the data from just the implementation of offering people bank accounts. So 49% of people who came through the program applied for a bank account. It was a far, a far higher rate of take up of the bank accounts than we expected. 55% um, of people applied for direct deposit. And to give you a sense, and again, the, um, the POP program was pretty surprised at that level of take up. Prior to the AFCO pilot, it was only 15% of people were applying um, for direct deposit of their paycheck. Again, we did incentivize it for the research purposes, but I think we also felt like the implementation of the way that it was sort of structured into the orientation was another factor in why people took up. Um, one thing we do want to say about the really positive take-up rates for folks, um, about a third of the people who attempted to open a bank account weren't able to successfully open that account. Um, so they worked with the bank, the bank thought they could, and then a third got denied later. Um, we worked with the bank to actually collect data on that, and we saw that about half of the folks, or almost half of the folks, it was because they had a negative report in check systems. And if you aren't familiar with check systems, I'm guessing most of you are, but it's, um, it's a system, it's like credit reporting for bank histories, so if you've maybe racked up some fees with a bank account, the bank has closed the account, they report you to systems like check systems, there's others, sort of account history reporting systems. Um, and once you're in that system, many financial institutions actually won't open an account with you. So people can be sort of effectively blacklisted from opening a mainstream financial institution account. Um, so this statistic just kind of shows you, moving into the data now to the results, just that over the 12 months we were following people, we did see some positive changes in their financial situation. So we saw an increase in credit scores over the 12 month. The use of alternative financial services went down. And again, sort of talking to the, the take up of the bank accounts, we did see that the percent of banked went from a third at baseline to almost 60% at six months. Uh, and even still at 12 months, it was about still over half reported having a bank account. The other thing though we do want to point out is looking at the, the employment over time. So again, sort of when people started this program, they were in a six month program where everyone had a full-time job. Um, so the six month was immediately after leaving the program. It's, you know, it's a little less than 20% were actually employed immediately after the POP program. 
even out going into 12 months, it's only about 35% were employed. These are fairly typical numbers for the program. I think it wasn't a surprisingly low amount. Um, but I think thinking through in the context of what findings you hope to find from financial counseling, this context of returning to unemployment, you know, is really going to sort of temper what we think the impact of an hour or two of financial counseling is going to have in the financial lives of these folks. Um, so now looking into sort of what was the impact of the financial counseling, right? So one indicator that we looked at was how did credit scores change over time? Um, so again, we did see that there was a positive increase for the whole group over the year, but compared to people who got financial counts and compared to those who didn't, did we see a difference? So what this chart is showing you, the top orange line is the, there's the treatment group, those who are offered counseling. So we see at six months that there was a slight increase compared to the treatment group, but after 12 months, the, the control group kind of caught up. So we didn't see a, a significant change in credit scores over a year for this population. Um, However, credit scores actually aren't that sensitive to short-term change. So they don't change very much over time. I mean, there are a few exceptions, um, but they're pretty sticky numbers. So we actually don't know that we think that this is the best measure of financial capability. So another thing that we looked at was the percent of debt that people had, what percent of that debt was past due. So how much are people behind on their bills? And here we did see a significant difference after financial counseling. So if you look at the whole group um, who were offered counseling, we saw, it's actually after 12 months, I should change the slide, we saw a 5% decrease in the percent of debt that was past due. Um, and like I said before, we also tracked, so we looked at the whole group that was offered counseling, and then we also know who actually attended counseling. So if you actually look at the group of people that attended counseling, it was actually a 14% decrease in the amount of debt that passed due, which I think we think, again, sort of in the financial lives of these folks is a pretty significant number. Um, and actually, we think that looking at debt past due is a better measure of a change that would be the result of this intervention. Um, that, you know, sort of like people are making a change. And so, and actually, when you look at how the credit bureaus calculate credit scores, the percent of debt past due is a really big factor in that. So we think that this is a proxy for future credit score changes. So again, then just looking at the bank, again, we think the most important trend is that overall the level of people getting banked um, went up significantly. We didn't really see a significant difference when people got financial counseling versus people that didn't. Um, and just to give you a little bit of the data on the account use. So most people open an account. Um, we had over 300 people open an account through this program or that we were able to look at data for them. You know, so only 28% of those incurred fees. So again, we feel like most people sort of successfully manage their account. But when people did incur fees, they were a really significant part of the balance that they had in their account. Um, so, you know, looking at just sort of that first column, if you look at average, if the average account balance is $100, average fees being $50, that's a big chunk of people's income that they're paying in fees. And again, these are safe accounts where there aren't monthly fees, they aren't sort of like hidden fees built in, it's just sort of, you know, non-sufficient fund fees, maybe using out of ATM, out of network ATM fees. Um, and the other thing that we just want to say is that at the end of this period, well, again, a lot of people were successfully managing their account, only 23% of accounts were still open. Um, and I think we did talk a little bit with people about their accounts. And I think in the light of a lot, that many people returning to unemployment, I think there's a lot of people who feel like if they don't have a job, they don't have a need for a bank account. They just don't think it's necessary. Um, so I think, you know, and I'm just going to jump to one of our insights from that. With that, I think it's important, well, I think, you know, a lot of us are really interested in how do we get people into mainstream bank accounts. I think it's still something for us to all think about, like, what are the appropriate financial products for these groups? And maybe a traditional bank account isn't the right thing for everyone, especially if people, if they're managing, if their income is really unstable and they're sort of moving in and out of employment, like, is there, is there another way to help folks manage these people that we can offer sort of a suite of services, or how can we improve some of the flexibility of these services so they feel like they're useful accounts to people as they're moving in and out of employment? Um, 
The other big key insight, you know, again, we think that this provides evidence that financial counseling can be beneficial, and we're really excited about having these positive findings. We also think that we have findings that shows you can integrate these services into these big public programs in a successful way and do it feasibly at scale with sort of minimal disruption to the operating of these programs. We think how you do it, how you communicate, how you message it, all of that really matters and it's important to think through. Um, you know, so I think I'll stop there and we can talk more about different parts of it and other questions. Um, so turn it back to Gretchen so we can get started on questions. Thank you all. So there are microphones in the, at a couple of different places in the room, and so people should work their way to the mics. And while people are coming up with their questions and um, getting to the mics, I'll kick us off with one. Um, so I wanted to ask the panel, you know, you have presented on a variety of different approaches to integrating um, services and strategies for increasing financial capability for participants in um, you know, workforce and um, TANF programs. What are some of the real challenges that you've encountered in thinking about how to design those, um, the interventions and thinking about how to integrate into existing um, programs and in thinking about really thinking about the needs of the program administrators and what their goals and objectives are and how you think about, you know, one day intensives versus, you know, working into the orientation sessions or, um, you know, trying to build something that's parallel, all of those sort of various factors for design. Uh, I'll start just uh, thinking about, so um, as part of the Asset Initiative Partnership, we've been looking at, at a lot of these different kinds of models, and I think, um, you know, one of the reasons that we were really excited about partnering with Utah was because it was um, sort of on one end of the spectrum in terms of the intensity of services that were being offered, and we kind of just wanted to see what, what that looked like a little bit more, while we also understanding from folks like um, the groups Mariana is working where it's going to be such an um, um, intense process, kind of helping us to kind of compare and contrast those differences. I would say a couple of things are important in thinking about design, though. Um, first, I think, is, is thinking through what is the touch point with the TANF recipient, um, and um, what is appropriate to kind of bundle at that point in time. Um, that is... Um, wrapped around what's the relationship between those two individuals in terms of trust um, factors. Um, and also thinking about what's the capability and capacity of that frontline service person in terms of what they can feasibly be doing in that moment. Um, and those two pieces, I think, then lead you to make some decisions to either, um, in terms of both in terms of the intensity of the service, but also thinking about is this something that you're asking, um, you know, your staff or the frontline staff people to be doing themselves? Um, are you asking to kind of bring in a third-party partner, um, much like um, Casey talked about having the bank there on site, uh, and they took care of the banking part, right? Um, or having the Fair Credit Foundation come in on site and they conducted the training and the, uh, and the other staff people were there to provide some additional kind of services um, around that, but they were not, you know, the ones directly doing that. Um, or are you actually just referring out to other services? So were you referring out to a financial empowerment center? And if you're looking at referral, if, if a referral point seems like the most um, likely way to do it, then what actually exists in the community that is appropriate and is um, capable of, of working with the unique needs of a TANF population, um, which is, I think, the other um, important um, thing that Mariana has been um, uh, dealing with lately as she designs her latest, her latest study. So those are a couple of considerations that come to mind for me. And I think, I would just add, I think in AFCO, just to really, and there may be folks from New York City here, I think we really had the benefit of building on a lot of existing partnerships and the, you know, the Financial Empowerment Center network existed. The Parks Department already had a really long-standing partnership with OFE. But I think one thing that when we talked with um, folks from Parks afterwards about sort of what they felt like the successes were, because again, they had been incorporating financial empowerment activities into their work for a long time. But I think what 
participating in this pilot helped them realize that they'd always treated them as like extra activities. It was sort of kind of like an optional thing they would do on top of the stuff they were already doing it, instead of like really incorporating it into the work that they were doing. So I think they realized that while they thought they were doing it, they weren't putting as much effort into it as they thought they were. And instead of sort of like building it into their orientation about like, let's talk about direct deposit, let's talk about getting you into a bank account. It's just a different level of service. And I think that they have changed some extent. They haven't, I think they haven't been able to keep up the level of AFCO as we had extra staff to come in and sort of provide these services, but I did think it helped them think about how fully are they actually integrating this stuff into their operations. Oh, there it is. Um, well, we've been working with the Department of Public Welfare with the state of Pennsylvania for um, over, over a year, I'd say a year and a half, and also getting a lot of advice and counseling from CFED and from others in the room, Assets for Independence. Um, and it has been, uh, what we wanted to do was actually be really comprehensive, knowing that it would be a big burden to integrate into an existing program. Um, and one of the things that we've been learning from the Women of Witnesses to Hunger is that they felt oftentimes that the current education and training programs that they were put into were a sink of time that didn't get them where they really needed to go. And also they were really struggling with childcare issues and with their kids being sick and managing their own health and managing their housing situation. So one of the things we wanted to do was actually make the financial counseling, financial education and the peer support be absolutely core and maybe take some of the pressure off of the families so that they would, it would free up time for them to work on other issues that were important to them. Um, that were not related to education and training. So it's been an interesting uh, collaboration to uh, have the um, activities that they're going to be doing with the financial education classes, and it's going to be 18 months. This is not a day or a few hours or a one-on-one -on -one session. This is 18 months of weekly showing up to financial education um, counseling and also the, the peer support which is the, the second intervention group. And um, some of the challenges are, we thought that, we, that there were existing financial education materials, um, but there is no uh, set of materials that were actually available for TANF recipients that moved beyond a few hours here and there, or even a day, or even a few weeks. So we've actually had to create something from scratch with the help of CFED and others. Um, and we don't really, we're hoping that it's actually gonna be useful um, to the families. Again, it's 18 months. We hope they stick with us for 18 months. That has been really challenging to get the Department of Public Welfare to accept it as core work activities. And the last thing we wanted to do is have 20 hours a week of financial education and peer support. So we can actually fill, with the second intervention group, we can fill probably 12 to 13 hours of the work participation time legitimately then we're going to have to, in order for the families to get childcare and transportation, transpasses, um, we're going to have to encourage them to report other kinds of hours that count towards the work requirement. So we'll be encouraging, um, because the women will be helping, will be learning about developing a business plan and developing their own uh, businesses for self-employment, um, they're going to have to report to us so that we can be legitimate with the feds and the state so that the women and men can get childcare subsidies and also not lose their TANF benefits to show that they're actually doing work participation. We were hoping to go in for a waiver, but um, the climate, political climate right now is really not conducive to getting a waiver to have these count towards the work requirement. So because the Philadelphia um, TANF caseload is um, in, the t in the tens of thousands, the, f the uh, 500 uh, families that we're gonna be working with will actually not necessarily affect uh, the Department of Public Welfare's bottom line for work participation. So right now, the, um, our agreement is that DPW will just kind of look this way <laughs> while we're working that way. We would really love for these um, activities to count towards the core work requirement, and we hope to show that actually taking the pressure off of all that work partic participation will actually incentivize the families to hold out for finding the better paying job and uh, Will, it will incentivize those little side businesses that they have so that the um, families start to feel a sense of power and mastery and control 
and gives, takes the, the uh, pressure off of the work participation, but actually gets them to work on goals that are important to them. So it's been really challenging also to get the savings accounts going with the credit union um, to make sure that it's a safe uh, savings account. We will be having the bankers come to the actual financial education classes to collect the money every week. It's very personal, very old school banking. It's like straight out of Mary Poppins. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And we'll, I'm sure I'll have more to report about um, how difficult and what, it, what the challenges are to integrate with, uh, with TANF in a year. So, but it's been challenging already, but we're starting on Monday. So it, we're, we're, we're getting there. So I see a question over here. Please introduce yourself before you ask the question. Hi, my name is Ife Floyd with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in DC. And I have a question about financial coaching um, and just any of the presenter's experience or knowledge about financial coaching as a complement to financial education and counseling. And when I say coaching, specifically helping a client work towards um, a, a self, a, 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 their identified financial goal. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I think um, financial coaching, I think, is, is um, something that we're hearing a lot of excitement about these days. It's kind of a, a, um, a dare I say, hot topic <laughs> um, uh, among uh, folks that, that um, care about these sorts of things. Uh, and there are a number of programs that are really starting to develop coaching capabilities. There's a lot, I think, still to be known about the most effective ways to do it um, and building up an evidence base around it. Um, but certainly New York City has done um, probably the most um, from a municipal perspective in terms of creating a, a, a infrastructure around coaching um, available to New York City residents. Um, so I will say that I think it's a promising thing. I think that there's sort of more to be um, determined both from a practice and a research standpoint about it, um, but it's certainly something that merits um, people continuing to, to start to do. And I would also say there are um, the, the, I'm pretty sure, and Louisa will shake her head if I'm wrong, that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is doing a study on, um, is doing some research on financial coaching. Um, and so, we, you know, we're all looking forward to sort of seeing what the results are from that. Um, I don't believe it's specific to, you know, sort of a social service or TANF population, but that, that should give us some information about what is, um, what is the impact of, of financial coaching. And then, in thinking about connecting financial coaching with workforce strategies, the Working Family Success Network, which is a collaboration between LISC, United Way Worldwide, and the NEA Casey Foundation, as well as several other founder, um, funders, um, is, and they've been um, supported by the Social Innovation Fund, which is out of the Corporation for Oh, I'm not going to get that right. The national, the people who do uh, VISTA and stuff, the Corporations for National and Community Service, I think. Um, and they also are doing some research on their model, which is a bundling of financial coaching, employment, training, and services, and um, benefits access and sort of looking at um, an asset building services, sort of looking at net income, increasing an individual's net income. And they do it in an integrated um, way. So there, I know that they have some research that I believe is going to be coming out next year, which may also be because of the connection with employment services and training might be very relevant to this kind of work as well. And just one quick shout mm -hmm. out too. So the, I think that the model that we're using in this program, I would call financial coaching. It is sort of people working towards an individual goal. Again, most people only attended one session. So, uh, you know, we can't actually track whether they achieved those goals. If people don't come back to the counseling, the counseling sessions don't know, you know, whether they've actually followed up in that stuff. But so again, I think our research is some of the really early evidence on the impact of financial coaching. I will give one plug if I can, Gretchen, um, um, which is for those who are interested in learning more about financial coaching and the whole range of, of financial capability strategies and asset building and kind of what's the cutting edge uh, in terms of practice, um, policy, and research. Um, every two years, CFED hosts the Assets Learning Conference. Um, it's here in DC, September 17th to 19th, so a couple more months. Uh, assetsconference.org, I hope to see you all there. And we'll take one last question. Um, hi, Ann Yeoman, I've been an asset consultant and, and um, was there for the very early days of these projects, the two of them anyway. 
Um, but I have a question because the, the comments particularly about uh, the fall off between intentions and actual behavior uh, and then some of the, Mariana's comments about uh, you know, the limitations around what counts for work participation. It takes me back to um, the, one of the first sessions on Wednesday, the idea of the executive function that practicing things transfers into other areas, whether it's deliberate or not. And so I guess I have two very broad questions. One is if any, you or anyone in the room has experience in sort of measuring that transfer from one activity to another. And the second is if, if there are state staff, state directors or whatever still in the room, um, whether there might ever be any policy considerations for the kinds of reasons that Mariana has pointed out of allowing activities that can be demonstrated to affect executive function to count as part of the developing the skills that we know people need to actually stay on. And so not go from 100% employed to 12% employed when the subsidized work is over or other kinds of behaviors. So, I, so um, I can't speak to executive function. I know that CFED is actually at this moment engaged in research that is um, delving into that a lot. I'm not uh, um, leading that work, so I can't sort of speak to the findings. I think it is something that we also, have, talking about sort of want to have at our next conference too. I think it's something that a lot of us are talking about now, we're interested in, and really seeing a lot of promise in it. So I think, so I do think that there are conversations that hopefully, I don't know if it's gone to a policy place yet, um, I feel like there are conversations where maybe it will. Um, I think that's all maybe I can say at the moment. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question, Anne. It's just, um, those are, uh, dealing with the executive function issue I think is, is profoundly important. And uh, I didn't get a chance to really talk about it, but w a couple of things that we're doing in the financial education um, classes is, first of all, we're going to be using the TABE test to get at um, literacy levels, literacy and also f um, numeracy, so that we can really understand where the uh, families are in terms of their knowledge and their capabilities to really be able to add and subtract and to read and to find out what, how we can improve our financial education based on what we're learning from their capabilities and what we're learning back from the participants. So there's going to be a lot of back and forth between our financial educators and the participants themselves. We'll, we'll be talking about issues such as selling food stamps and what is the return on investment when you do sell your food. I mean, we're going to be really deep in it and learning alongside, and we think that that will um, help the financial education products that we develop out of this to be really, to be really appropriate for the groups um, who are participating in TANF. But we really actually think that the most important and profound impacts will come from those peer support groups, which I didn't really talk about yet uh, today. And those are based in a very trauma-informed approach um, to providing um, social support. And by trauma-informed, I really mean making sure that the systems that we have in place are acknowledging um, people's exposure to violence uh, currently and also during childhood and how that affects how, um, uh, how, a, how an individual is able to cope with their current circumstances. So um, there's a lot of um, evidence that shows that people who experience trauma have a really hard time um, with decision making and thinking about the future, have a really hard time uh, having issues with anxiety so they can't necessarily focus and also sleeplessness um, or um, hyper arousal. So they, there are constant triggers in the neighborhood or constant triggers with what people say. So when we do the peer support, we're focusing it around this concept of self, dealing with safety, emotions, loss, and future. And that will be 18 months of this peer support that the backbone will be this trauma-informed support that we think will help to improve executive function. And we're measuring that through self-efficacy and maternal depressive symptoms, and also their participation, their ongoing participation, how connected they feel, to our network, how connected they feel to each other, and how they connect, how connected they feel to um, their their own social networks in their neighborhoods. So, we'll, and we'll also be we also think that as they participate in these social groups, they'll learn a lot about a lot of things that are related to work readiness. So, showing up on time, being able to um, cooperate with their group and facilitate with their group, and also develop 
group-oriented goals so that the, the families that we're working with will be able to express um, their, their common goals as a group and also their individual goals, and they'll be getting social support every week as we move forward. And we'll be able to measure that through pre and post. Every five weeks, we're going to be checking in with the uh, participants to learn. So we'll be doing qualitative and quantitative uh, process evaluation, and then also qualitatively learning back from the participants to see how well it's going. Uh, we're not, so we are measuring self-efficacy and self-mastery um, and connectedness. We're not really sure that those are the best measures yet, and we've been talking with Crittenden Women's Union and others that are working on the um, on executive functioning, and we hope that maybe we can figure out how to learn, to learn how to uh, be able to capture what's really going on, because we're, we're thinking that we're focusing on self, on, on uh, sort of the self-mastery and executive function, but it's, it's difficult to figure out how to measure. Again, we're working with families for a total of at least 18 months, we hope, baseline and ever six months follow-up, and we hope we can, we hope we can stick with it and that they can stick with it. You know, this is really, the magnitude of our approach is pretty, pretty large and we're hoping they'll stay on it. We don't know. So we hope to learn more as we go along. As always with research conversations, there's always more questions to be answered and more um, findings to be reported later. So um, please join me in thanking our panel.